Daniel Webster. Many of us have had our hide saved by Brother Webster before. Of course, preeminent American spokesman, legislature, and the author of Webster uh, Dictionary. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury our glory in profound obscurity. And I don't think this man realized how prophetic his words were. Because we're seeing that happen right before our very eyes. Andrew Jackson, U.S. President. Quote, that book, sir, is the rock on which our republic stands. And of course, many of you were alive when Ronald Reagan was president. Quote, indeed, it is an indisputable fact that all the complex and horrendous questions confronting us at home and worldwide have their answer in that single book. Here's a president of the United States in a national speech saying, Every problem we face at home and every problem we face worldwide, the answer is in this book. Amen. Now, I've just given you about five select quotes from very prominent people that are household names. When you hear their name, you usually, yeah, I usually sit up and pay attention because if they're saying something, uh, usually it's important. But let's drill down a little bit further. Although many great people have extolled the importance of the Bible, it doesn't get its value simply because George Washington said it was a good book. Abraham Lincoln said it was a good book. Daniel Webster, Andrew Jackson, Ronald Reagan. It's important because it's God's Word. Because it's God's Word, important people have a lot of things to say about it. It's not important because important people have a lot of good things to say about it. Now, while it was physically penned by human beings, every word in the Bible is divinely inspired by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Peter writes, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Listen, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What does that verse mean? In a nutshell, it means this. You and I do not have the liberty to read this book and get some private interpretation and walk away and say, well, when I read this, this is what I think this means. It means what it means, and it says what it says, and it is applicable to everybody. Amen. Maybe it fits your unique personal situation a little more closely than it does my personal situation, but it's not a private interpretation for you. In other words, thou shalt not kill. You can't say, well, I was in prayer and the Lord said that verse didn't apply to me because I hate my neighbor and I'm going to put a bullet in their head. There is no private interpretation. Thou shalt not steal. Well, the Lord told me that I could steal diapers from my kids if I needed to because that's exempt. That's a private interpretation. 2 Timothy 3.16, we read it earlier. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. The Bible is important because it is absolute truth. It is reliable. It is dependable. And you and I can have total confidence and trust in the truth of the Word of God. Listen, folks, the same Bible that the patriarchs of old trusted in the same scripture that the apostles trusted in is the same scripture we trust in. And not one time, Old Testament, New Testament, and current in the church age, has the Bible failed. Amen. Psalm 119, 160. Hopefully you're writing some of this down, keeping track. If you're watching online, I hope you're turning to these verses. And if you're watching in person, follow along with me in the scripture. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So here's David way back in the Old Testament saying, the word of God is true all the way from the beginning and it'll last all the way to the end. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that 
belief. What does that mean? When you come to church and you hear the preacher preaching, whether it's me, one of our local ministers, a guest speaker, no matter who it is, you need to sit there and say, that might be that person talking to me through their personal filter of their personality and their idiosyncrasies. I'm hearing their voice. I'm seeing their mannerisms. But when it's all said and done, that's God talking to me. That person is not God, no. But it's the spokesperson of God. Why? Because it's coming out of this book. And if it's coming out of this book, I want to sit up and pay attention. Whether it's a Wednesday night, whether it's a personal devotion, reading early in the morning, maybe as you tend to do, or late at night if that's your, if that's your habit, or if it's on a Sunday, I want to sit up and say, what is God's Word going to tell me today? The Bible is important because it's absolute truth. Second reason why the Bible is important is because it is unchanging, eternal, and everlasting. Psalm 119, 89. Many of you can quote this. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. I'm glad it's settled in heaven because the earth sure has not got a whole lot settled. But it's settled in heaven. Isaiah 40 and 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand Forever. Everybody say forever. So it's not going to go out of style. Amen. I was uh, with my wife last Friday night on our weekly date. We were we had eaten and went a couple places looking around some things. And God forbid, lo and behold, bell bottoms are coming back in style. What a debauchery of mankind. What a horrible piece of our history. What a waste of fabric. Bell bottoms. Things come and go, don't they? Men's suits, the lapels get big, lapels get small. Bell bottoms come, bell bottoms go. Hairstyles change. Skinny ties come in, fat ties come in, skinny ties come in. Man, I'm going to stop throwing those things away. I'm going to just put them in certain closets and recycle them every couple years, right? Yeah. Wingtip shoes come in, wingtip shoes go out. You know, fashions change. People change, right? And, and the old, the old, the old uh, saying in the Scripture, of course, is, and, and many of you, uh, the, the principle that we live by is what comes around goes around. We've seen a lot of things happen. But the Bible never changes. It's constant. It's the same. Amen. Matthew 24, 35. Here's what Jesus said. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, this is something we don't think about a whole lot. Even after Armageddon, even after the thousand-year millennium, even after the earth is destroyed by fire and God creates a new earth, the Bible will still be the Bible. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. Why cannot the word pass away? Because John 1 14 the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and Jesus can't pass away. Jesus can't fade away. He is omnipotent omniscient and omnipresent. 1 Peter 1 25 the word of the Lord endureth forever and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So the second reason the Bible is important is because it is unchanging eternal Everlasting. The third reason the Bible is important, and this really kind of hits where we're living today, is because it gives us answers and instructions for the issues of life. Kind of like Abraham Lincoln said, every problem you've ever faced, the answer's in that book. Kind of like Ronald Reagan said, every problem America's facing or around the world, the answer's in that book. Well, first of all, it tells us that mankind needs a Savior. Romans 5 and 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who was that one man? Adam. Now, think about that. Eve is the one that first sinned. But Jesus comes along and says, I'm not going to impute that to Eve because Adam's the spiritual leader of the house. I'm going to say Adam brought sin into the world. As by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. I don't care how apostolic you are. I don't care what pedigree you come from. I don't care how important you think you are. You came out of your mother's womb a sinner just like I did, just like Paul did, just like Adam did, everybody except Jesus. All have been born in sin, shapen in iniquity. 
So it tells of mankind need for a Savior. Number two, the Bible reveals God's love for the lost world. John 3.16, if you know it, quote it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Third reason the Bible is important because it gives us answers and instructions is it portrays God's plan for saving the world. Do you know that you can find out how to be saved in that book? John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Water birth is baptism. Spirit birth is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are. It doesn't matter where you live, what your zip code is, what possessions you own, how much is in your bank. It doesn't matter who you're related to. We all are going to hell and we need Jesus and we can find the answer in that book. Amen. That's right. The fourth reason why the Bible is important because it gives us answers and instructions is this. It imparts God's instructions on how we should live. So not only can I find out how to Be saved, I can find out how to stay saved. Dads, I can find out how to be a better dad. Husbands, I can find out how to be a better husband. Moms, you can find out how to be a better mom. Wives, you can find out how to be a better wife. Young person, you can find out how to be a great crusader for the Lord. Single person, you can find out how to fulfill your potential. Because the Bible doesn't just get you in, it helps keep you in. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ... Dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Listen to this. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So when we come to church, we don't just come together and preach and talk about Scripture. We sing, we worship, we rejoice. That's all part of the learning process. Now, I'm going to give you some pretty amazing Facts about the Bible. I'm sure some of you will want to note this. The word Bible comes from the Greek word biblos, and it simply means book. It was the name given to the pulp of the papyrus reed upon which ancient books were written. So the plural form of biblos is biblia. Biblos is singular, book. The plural is Biblia, and by the 2nd century A.D., Christians were using the word Biblia to describe the Holy Scriptures. In other words, Christians were referring to this book as the books. We know it is a book, but it's a book comprised of many small books. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew. Some of you know this, some of you do not. The New Testament was primarily written in Hebrew. Greek, and if you're a new convert, and maybe you hear from time to time a preacher say, in the Hebrew, this is what that means. In the Greek, they're not trying to get fancy. All they're trying to do is take the Old Testament writing and say, this is what the author meant by that original word. And they take the New Testament writing and say, let's look into that word and see what it meant. Because what it means today is not maybe what it meant Back then, And after all, if we're searching for truth, we want to get down to what the Bible is telling us to do. Right? Here's another interesting fact. Cardinal Hugo divided the Bible into chapters in 1250 A.D. Can you imagine being in church and the pastor say, Let's turn to the book of Isaiah. And flip over about 16, 17 pages, depending on the size of your font. Uh, Just tell me when you're there. And people are looking. There's no chapter. There's no verse. Can you imagine? I don't know what Cardinal Hugo believed. I think I have a sneaking suspicion. But he did one thing right by dividing the Bible into chapters. Everybody say, thank you, Cardinal Hugo. Thank you. That's in 1250 A.D. Now get this. 200 years later, 1450 A.D., the first printing press was invented. And guess what? The Bible was the first book printed on the first printing press. When they invented the printing press, they said, Aha! Let's get the Bible out to the common folk. 
Can you imagine prior to this time, copies of the scripture were copied by hand? Scribes would stand at a lectern kind of like this and lean and would copy every verse word for word, chapter by chapter by hand. You talk about a laborious process. You talk about a time-consuming process. If you can never get your hand on an old copy from the 15, 1600, it is worth a lot of money. And it is history in your hand. Sir Robert Stevens divided the Bible into verses in 1551 A.D. Everybody say, thank you, Sir Robert Stevens. So Cardinal Hugo divided it up in chapters in 1250. Several hundred years later, Sir Robert Stevens says, you know what? Um, thank God for chapters, but we really need a little more help with that. Let's go to verses. Because now, lay people had copies of Bibles. They were bringing them to church. Prior to that time, only the priests had a copy of the Bible. And so it wasn't a big deal. They'd study before the service, and they'd go to the chapter, maybe, after Sir Cardinal Hugo, and they'd go to the chapter, and they could find what they were needing. But when the lay people were sitting in the pews, they were having trouble keeping up. So Sir Robert Stevens says, let's divide it into verses. I say that because when you're in a service or you're studying, and you go to a verse and then you go to another verse, keep in mind, man is the one that put that break there. And usually there's a break where there's punctuation. A period, a colon, a semicolon, etc. There's a break, okay? Also keep in mind that man divided chapters. So sometimes you'll come to the end of a chapter and you'll think, oh, the next chapter is a new thought. Sometimes it's not a new thought. Sometimes it's a continuation of an existing thought. All right? Just something to help you when you study. King James Bible is divided into 66 books. Here's an easy way to remember that. Take the Old Testament. The word old has three letters, O-L-D. If you write three down, Testament has nine letters. Write nine down, three and nine side by side is 39. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. New Testament, the word new has three letters. If you say three times nine, Testament has nine letters, three times nine is 27. That's how many books are in the New Testament. If you add 39 and 27 together, it's 66. That's how many books are in the Bible. If you really want to know, please don't let your eyes cross on this, there are 1,189 chapters. If you really want to be nerdy, there's 31,214 verses. And if you really, really are like top geek type issue going on, 773, 746 words. And to anybody that's just out of touch with reality, there are 3,566,480 letters. Thank you very much. Longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. Shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117. Two chapters before the longest chapter. Esther 8 and 9. I've got a dollar for anybody that can tell me right now. Well, no, I just gave you the answer. Esther 8 and 9 is the longest verse. Esther 8 and 9. Yeah. <laughs> Freddie, always looking for... Not today. And I know, I know you know the next one, Brother Freddie, so I'm not even going to challenge you on that. The shortest verse... Well, I know what it says, but where's it, where's it at? John eleven thirty five. I taught you that in Bible study 20 years ago. You should know that. John eleven thirty five 35 is the shortest verse. He quoted it just a moment ago. Jesus wept. The longest verse in the Bible is Esther 8 and 9. What is the book of the Bible that never mentions God? Not one time. God is mentioned at all. Lord, God, Jehovah, nothing in this one book. The book of Esther. God is never mentioned. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of salvation. You see the Lord, the theme of the Lord and His delivering power in it, but God is never mentioned. There are roughly 1,250 promises in the Bible given to people in various time periods. 
And when you strip a lot of those away out of context and realize that maybe a promise to the children of Israel at a particular moment doesn't apply to you and I today, when you strip all of those away, there are still 500 promises left to believers today. That's well over one a day. That's like one and a half a day. So if you need something to get out of bed tomorrow, keep in mind there's a fresh 1.5 promise waiting on you. Ten a week. Here's another interesting bit of trivia. The Bible was penned by 40 different men, listen to this, who wrote on three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, over a span of 1,500 years. Three different continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, 40 different men, 1,500 years, and not one time can you show me in this book where one of them contradicted the other one. Not one time. You want to know why? Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The same Holy Ghost that moved upon Moses in the Old Testament to write the Pentateuch is the same Holy Ghost that moved on Paul to write the epistles in the New Testament. Not one time did they ever contradict each other. That is only possible, friend, if there is a single author. For instance, Moses, he was a prince educated in the universities of Egypt. Peter was a fisherman, zero education. He could cuss real good, but didn't have a good education. Amos and David, just humble herdsmen. Joshua, a military general. Luke was a doctor, very educated. Solomon was a king, the wisest man on the planet outside of Jesus Christ. Matthew was a tax collector. Paul was a rabbi, an attorney. All of these men, God used their talents, God used their skills, God used their abilities, and not one time did they ever contradict each other. The Bible was written in different locations. I've already told you three continents, but take a look at this. Moses wrote in the wilderness. Jeremiah wrote in a dungeon. And historians say that Jeremiah was up to his armpits in human waste in a dungeon and he had to put the parchment up on the side of the dungeon and write at an angle to keep the parchment from being becoming filthy. They would lower the parchment in the dungeon, lower the quill and the ink and the pen and he would write and then they would haul it up and that put the book of Jeremiah together. Daniel wrote from a hillside and in a palace. Paul wrote in a prison. Luke wrote while traveling. John wrote on the Isle of Patmos, horribly burned and disfigured while they tried to boil him in oil, and he survived. And he wrote the book of Revelation on an island filled with hardened convicts. David wrote during the rigors of military campaigns. And in spite of the diversity of all of these men, their backgrounds, their education, their life experiences, the Bible is uniquely harmonious. It speaks with one voice. Now, I will tell you, some of you didn't know this, the books of the Bible are arranged by subject. They are not in chronological order. Genesis is not the oldest book of the Bible. The book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible. But let's start with the first five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses wrote these five books. And this is called the Pentateuch. P-E-N-T-A means five or 50. We have a building in D.C. called the Pentagon. If you've ever seen a pentagram, it has five points. Pentecostal. The church was born on the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after the Feast of the Passover. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. It's also called the Torah. So if you hear a Jewish person talking about the Torah, they're talking about the Pentateuch, the same thing that we know of as the Pentateuch. The next 12 books of the Old Testament are history. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther history. This is where you're going to find some amazing stories of exploits of the Jewish people. Amazing stories of God's deliverance. Miracles happening out in the wilderness. Miracles happening in the nation of, of, of Israel. How God delivered them from the enemy and over and over and over. The stories you've grown up, if any of you have a history of going to Sunday school, vacation Bible school, stories you've grown up hearing, they're in these books. The next five books of the Bible 
in the Old Testament are poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. This is usually what you would hear at a funeral. This is usually what you're going to hear at a wedding, baby dedication, something of that nature. They're calming, soothing books. How many times have I been called to pray with someone who's dying and they want to hear something out of the book of Psalms? They want to hear something out of the book of Proverbs because it has a soothing quality. The major prophets are the next five books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Limitations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the next 12 are the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Abacah, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, 12 minor, five major, 12 minor. It doesn't mean that the major ones are over here in their own little club. They're like, yeah, we're important. They just live longer. And because they live longer, they got to write more before they died. They were all killed. The minor prophets churned out a chapter or two and then got killed. So they're the minor prophets. Minor in the sense that they only wrote a little bit before they were executed. Okay? Major, minor. Book of Malachi does not end with the word amen. Who's got a Bible here tonight? Brother Andrew, would you go to the, and your Bible may not have this in it, but it might. Go to the end of the book of Malachi. Right before, and anybody else that has a Bible, go ahead and do this too. I just want to see if your Bible's, this is where you need an actual Bible, not a digital. All right. Verse 6 of Malachi chapter 4. What are the last three words? Period. Is there an amen after that? Okay, do you have a blank white piece of paper between the old and the new? You do. Bring it up here. Let me see it. Some Bibles have this, some don't. I'm going to explain to you what this means. There's a blank white piece of paper between the old and the new. That represents 400 years of man's silence. 400 years. A Jewish generation is 40 years. Ten Jewish generations went by. No prophet, no word, no, no voice from God, no sermon, no nothing. 400 years of silence. And then the New Testament starts. John the Baptist breaks the silence and says, prepare you the way of the Lord and introduces the Messiah. Now, there's a blank sheet in Brother Andrew's Bible. Some Bibles have a whole page, both sides that are blank. Has anybody got a whole page that is just a thin page with nothing on it. Anybody? I have some in my office that have that. Quickly, and I'll close. New Testament. Now, first of all, stop right there. We keep using that word testament. What is a testament? What, how do we use it in our common vernacular that we're always familiar with? A last will and testament, right? Short speak is a will. i got to get my will done. But when you go to the lawyer's office and you sit down, it's going to say, last will and testament. The testament, the last will and testament, does not go into effect until somebody dies. That person is called, in our common day, we would call them the decedent, right? In the Bible days, we call that the testator. When the testator dies, the testament goes into effect. Why is the Old Testament called the Old Testament? Because it's God's old last will and testament. We just have the benefit of reading both of them. Usually when a client comes to my office and does a new will, we take the old one to the shredder and shred it. We don't want it hanging around so the fifth cousin can find it and realize they're not getting the farm like they thought they were. Right? We shred it. God lets us see, this was my old will. This is how I was providing for you under the old plan, but now there's a new plan. It's called the New Testament. Amen. Question, did the testator die? Jesus, did he die? Yes, he died, he buried, he was risen again. So the New Testament is now in effect. Think about it that way. It'll help you understand it. First four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These are called the synoptic gospels. Synoptic comes from the root word synonymous. We understand that to be synonym. Another word is same. So if Brother Brian and I 
and Brother Bill and Brother Freddie are standing out here in the parking lot talking one night after church, and all of a sudden we hear a horrible noise of tires screeching and engines revving, and we glance over at the corner of Piney Grove, Piney Grove and Vance, and we witness a car wreck. State trooper's going to show up. Forsyth County Deputy Sheriff's going to show up. They're going to come in here in the parking lot. And most of the time when there's a crowd witnessing a wreck, standard protocol is they're going to separate us. Sir, would you come over here? Sir, would you step over here? Would you step over here? And then they're going to say, tell me what you saw. Well, I saw the red car come around the corner, and the blue car was doing okay. And I noticed that one guy was looking down at his cell phone. I could see the glow of the cell phone in his face. And bam, he rear-ended him. All right, stay right there. Thank you very much. Brother Brian, what did you see? Well, all I noticed was one guy had a raccoon trap on the back of his truck. And he was eating Chick-fil-A. And man, I'm going to tell you, he wasn't paying attention at all. And oh, okay, thank you, sir. Brother Bill, what did you say? Well, I saw one guy. It, it looked like he had a generator in his, in his trunk. And uh, he had some plumbing pipes hanging out the window. And uh, I saw something on the back, the back of his car. It said, I love Wisconsin. And, and Freddie's going to say something that something he saw, something he noticed. What is the point? All of us saw the same incident, but we all picked up on details particular to us as individuals. Brother Brian noticed the raccoon trap because he, he, he traps animals. Brother Bill is uh, Wisconsin years ago, so he noticed that. And me, uh, you know, I, whatever I notice, and, and we're all going to notice different things, Brother Freddie. And so what the officer does is he puts all those stories together to get a well-rounded picture. Amen. So when you read Matthew, the story of the crucifixion of Jesus... Also flip over and read Mark and flip over and read Luke and flip over and read John because they all saw the same thing, but they witnessed it in a different light. And it's amazing some of the things that one of them picks up on that the other did not. I don't have time to get into some of the differences, but that's not contradiction, folks. They all witnessed the same story. In other words... John's not going to say Jesus died on the cross and Luke says, no, he didn't. He got up and walked off. He's fine. No, they all saw him die on the cross, but they noticed different things about the crucifixion. There is only one book of history in the New Testament, and that is the book of Acts. The book of Acts does not end with the word amen because it is still being written. How many chapters are in the book of Acts? How many? 28. That's why we call our youth Acts 29, because they're continuing the book of Acts, okay? Acts of the Apostles, and Acts 2.38, somebody once said, I got an Acts in 2.38, that's all I need to get to heaven. Well, I don't know about the veracity of that. Um, we need a little bit more, but uh, I understand what you're saying. The Epistles are the next 21 books, and I'm closing with this. The Epistles are the next 21 books, Romans 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd 3rd John, Jude. Now, 14 of those are written by Paul. And they start with Romans. Paul wrote the book of Romans to the church in Rome. Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians to the church in Corinth. He wrote the book of Galatians to the church in Rome. Galatia, Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus, etc., etc. These were not people that needed the Holy Ghost. These were people that already had the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you cannot go to the book of Romans, and as our good Baptist friends are prone to tell you, walk the Roman road to find Jesus because there ain't no Roman road. There's an axe road, there's no Roman road. People in Rome had already been baptized, already got the Holy Ghost. They didn't need the plan of salvation. They already had it. Starting with the book of James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, the author of the book is who the book is named after. James wrote the book of James. Peter wrote 1st and 2nd Peter. John wrote 1st and 2nd, 3rd John. Jude wrote the very short book of Jude. And then we have Revelation. What a phenomenal book. People say, man, I read Revelation. I get scared. You don't need to be scared by reading Revelation. Amen. 
If you've got the Holy Ghost, you have nothing to be afraid of. I love teaching the book of Revelation. I love reading the book of Revelation. It is full of metaphors. It is full of symbolism. It is full of prophecy. It is just awesome. You can read three verses in the book of Revelation, and it gives you a global view from the creation of man to the coming of the Lord in three verses. It is phenomenal. The book of Revelation was written by John. John, the beloved. Jesus was with the disciples one day, and they got into this very interesting discussion of how are they going to die. And Jesus looked at John and said, you're not going to die like the others are going to die. Now, I don't know what that meant to John at that moment, but I can promise you he didn't, he, it didn't mean what, he, what was going to happen. He never thought that it was going to mean what actually took place. Here's what happened with John. When the Romans got ready to kill John, they came up with this ingenious plan. We're going to boil this huge vat of oil. Folks, we would call that grease. Have any of you ever worked at a fast food place? All right, put your hands down. How many of you have ever fried chicken at a fast food place? How many of you have ever fried french fries at a fast food place? You want to talk about some hot stuff. My palms get sweaty just talking about it. That grease is just Roiling, and you can accidentally drop something in it, and it's snap, crackle, pop. I mean, it makes all kind of noises. You put them fries down, they may smell wonderful, but I promise you, it doesn't feel wonderful down in there. Can you imagine? They walk you up a gangplank and kick you in a vat of boiling oil, and John didn't die. Now, he came out horribly scarred, horribly disfigured, but he lived. And so Jesus' words to him, you will not die as the others die. That was prophetic. Why? Because we needed the book of Revelation to be penned. Romans had a law, kind of like our law in America today. It's a law against double jeopardy. You cannot be convicted of the same crime twice. Okay? So if you are, if you are charged with murder in the first degree, you go up to Forsyth County Superior Court, There's a jury trial, and the jury says, not guilty. The prosecutor can't say, good Lord, let's charge him again. No, double jeopardy. You cannot be charged twice with the same crime. Okay? The Romans had that law. Where did we get that law? We got that law from Europe. That's a Roman concept. Our founding fathers were from England. They had the European influence from Rome. And so that law is in most first world countries. It's just a... It's a common thing. The Romans even went a step further from that. And some of our states practice this. If they were to execute a person and the execution failed, Roman law said you cannot try to kill him twice. It must have been providence that they were not supposed to die. Let them go. And so when they threw John in this vat of boiling oil and he came out spitting and a sputtering and walking, they said, we ain't trying that again. Put him on the Isle of Patmos and let him just rot with the other prisoners. But I ain't throwing him in there no more. And it was on the Isle of Patmos, which is kind of like what we would think of Alcatraz without all the buildings. It was a deserted, hot, barren island surrounded by sharks. The prisoners could not swim to the mainland. They basically were stuck. And about once a week or so, the Romans would ferry food and supplies over throw it under heavy guard and ferry back. And this was a life sentence. And this is where John the Beloved became John the Revelator. And he wrote the book of Revelation. And he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Even on Sunday, John, on a prisoner's island, went to church. In his mind, in his spirit, in his heart, he went to church. He got in the Spirit. And I love, and I close with this. I know I've said that a few times, but I'm serious this time. When John saw heaven, no more pain, no more tears, no more sickness, no more heartache, no more sea. Now, when I read that, I think, what's wrong with the sea? I like the sea. How many of you like the ocean? I love the ocean. But the sound of that water reminded John constantly, 24-7, that he would never see his family again, never see his home again, 
never be able to go back and eat his wife's good cooking, his mother's good cooking, his sister's good cooking. He was stuck on an island with rapists and murderers and thieves and, and wicked, wicked people. It reminded him every day of the separation of pain, of suffering. Heaven's going to be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But to John, it was no more sea. To some of us, it might be like, oh, no more, you know, power bills. <laughs> no more rent. No more mortgage. I mean, we'd laugh about it today if John would have wrote, and I saw in heaven, no more mortgage. But heaven might be that to you and I. Amen. Heaven's going to be an awesome place. Next week, Brother Brian is preaching. When we come back, I will pick back up on this important lesson. I hope you've learned something from the Word of God tonight. I love teaching the Word of God. I love studying the Word of God. And I want to be what Paul said when he told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. I don't claim to know everything about the Bible. Every time I read, I learn something else. But I want to be a student of the Word. Somebody say amen. Let's stand together tonight. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being an attentive crowd. Amen. It's still early. Let's pray right now. Father, I pray that our hearts would receive your word this evening. We know the word of God is the most powerful force in our lives. And I pray that this church would be a church that is built on good, strong, doctrinal teaching and preaching. We thank you for the move of the Spirit we thank you for shouting and singing and worshiping. We relish in that, God. We enjoy that. We know that is a vital part of our apostolic worship and our apostolic demonstration. And as the old preacher said, it don't care how high you shout when your feet hit the ground. Walk a straight line. I want to make sure I'm a student of the word. Go with us tonight. Protect us. Keep your hand upon us. Keep us safe. Touch all of those that are traveling. Bring them safely home. Those that are sick, heal their bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, I love the Word of God. Amen. Todd and Madison, thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate you being here on a Wednesday night. God bless you. Amen. I hope all of you have a safe week. Don't forget Sunday. Bring a guest. Bring a visitor. Let's have a great service. Amen. You're dismissed.